88-92, Bob Dylan. When I was a kid going to St. Matthew's grade school, I would carry Bob Dylan records around so that people would see them, they would see that I had Bob. You understand that thing? Mm -hmm. I wanted people to see that. His first 10 albums, probably, I knew every song. Every word could play it. It play all the parts, everything. Knew the stuff inside out. Uh, Elliot Roberts, who I mentioned, the manager, calls me one day at the office at Saturday Night Live. This would have been in maybe the spring of 88. Yeah. And uh, he says, hey, tomorrow night, can you get a bass player and a drummer and be at this there's a rehearsal studio in town called Montana? Can you be at Montana about 10 o'clock? Uh, Bob is in town. I've never met Bob at this point. Bob is in town and he wants to play. I said, sure, not a problem. I'm very excited. You know, this would be cool. So I get T-Bone and Chris Parker, the guys from the band. I say, tomorrow night, 10 o'clock, we're going to play with Bob Dylan up in Montana. Cool. Okay? So you know at 5, 10 minutes at 10, we are on that stage. Amps are on. We're tuned up. We're ready. There's no one there. There wasn't a um, receptionist. There was no one. You came up in the elevator and... The place is dead empty, but it was unlocked. It was open just for us, as it turns out, you know. So we just kind of standing there and talking. I don't even think we played. We were, we were nervous, you know. This is Bob Dylan. This is, I can't compare his um, iconic stature to anyone now in a similar in, in music, you know, what Bob meant. They had put that thing on Bob, which I later talked to him about, the savior of a generation, you know. I mean, he was the guy that influenced the Beatles, you know. I mean, he influenced, I mean, he was the guy. The whole 60s, 70s thing, Bob invented that. So we're standing there on the stage. And finally, at some point, after maybe 45 minutes, it was a pretty good-sized room, and it was dark in the back. Out of the darkness comes this guy with the hoodie. He's got the gloves with the fingers cut off, you know. Fingers sticking out so we can play with him. Hey, he hands you the... Bob doesn't shake hands real hard, you know. He's one of those guys that just hands you the dead fish. All things which I would come to love later, you know. But at first, it's like... Well, that's weird. Uh, and he puts on his guitar. His guitar and amp were there already when we got there. He puts on his guitar and he starts kind of noodling around. He doesn't really say much to us. And we, we're kicking in behind him, you know. We can hear. We know what's going on. Following him. And it's, it's okay, but it's a little herky-jerky and not pointed in any direction, you know. So after maybe a half hour or so of that, I'm thinking, boy, this is not going well here. This is, I don't know what he wants to do. Me and T-Bone are looking at each other like, buddy, what is this? So at some point, I'm standing right next to Bone. And Bob walks over to us and goes, so uh, you guys know Pretty peggy -O? And we both, like twins, would do. We go, sure! And he goes, you do? We go, yeah, we know Pretty Peggy. Of course we know Pretty Peggy. You know, that's who we are. We know Pretty Peggy. -o. We're the guys that know Pretty Peggy. -o. So he starts playing Pretty Peggy, -o, and we kick in, and Bones sing in harmony, and it's really good, because we know Pretty Peggy. -o. It's this old Civil War song. The captain, he is dead. You know, one of those. Come, come running down the stairs, combing back your yellow hair, pretty peggy -o. So we do that, and Bob got happy, you know, and, and he kept playing. We played for hours without stopping. 
It was really fun. So we finally got out of there at some point early, early in the morning. And uh, we all go home. And we thought that was it, you know. It was a night Bob just wanted to play Pretty Peggy O and some sauce. Next day, phone rings in the office. It's Elliot Roberts again. He goes, all right, you got the gig. I said, what? He said, you got the gig. He said, that was your audition. Didn't I tell you it was an audition? I said, no, Elliot, you did not tell me it was an audition, which I'm glad he didn't. He said, yeah, you got the gig. Well, what I eventually found out, and I think that this is probably basically true, is Bob, had, Bob wanted to go from having a great big band he had done tours with Tom Petty's band backing him up. He had done a tour with the Grateful Dead backing him up. From having a big, well-known band, he wanted now to just get a little, the standard rock unit, two guitars, bass, and drums, and he wanted to go out and play like that. So he had gone around the country and been auditioning guitar, bass, and drum units. And the question would always come, do you know Pretty peggy -O? And nobody else knew it. Me and T-Bone, we knew Pretty Peggy O, so that's apparently what got us the job. Although then T-Bone didn't ever do the tour, and it turned into four years I was there. It's what they call the never-ending tour. It's still going on. You know, I could still be there. Um, T-Bone didn't do it because he was hooked up with Daryl very tightly, and, and they wanted to do things, so I understand that. But I missed him out there. But Chris Barker did it, the drummer. And we went out with Bob. Channel Night Live, uh, I think it's still the same, was 20 shows spread from like October to May, maybe. And they're obviously on Saturday night. Bob had Elliot talk to Lauren. Elliot and Lauren know each other. You know, big mucky mucks in the business all know each other, of course. Uh, and Bob said, just tell us, you know, Lauren knew in advance the whole season what nights those 20 shows are going to be. Tell us, and we won't book shows. Those Saturday nights, Saturday night is the big money night when you're out on the road. You can get more money on the weekend than you can get on a Wednesday, right? Bob didn't do shows because me and Chris would go back and do SNL. So... I'm always just in awe of that little factlet mm -hmm. that, but Bob was, was great. He was very cool. He's Bob Dylan. Throughout the first year that I was there, he never really said much, you know? I mean, this was by 1988. You know, he's been one of the most famous people since 1961 or something. He's been through it all every bit of anything, the craziness, you know. You know, when you, when you get that famous, you can't go to the movies. You can't go pump gas in your car. Simple little things. You can't really go to the grocery store unless it's like your little local store where they're so used to that they've already all got your autograph and gotten the selfie with you in, you know? So anyway, about the first year, Bob doesn't really interact much with any of us in the band, other than I would go in in the afternoon and we'd make up a set list, wherever we were, you know, Fort Wayne, Indiana, or Houston, or wherever we were. I'd sit down with him and he'd say, well, what if we do this one or that one? And because I knew all the songs, I would suggest some stuff to him and sometimes he'd say yeah and sometimes he'd say no. So we'd start out electric, we would do an electric portion, then uh, Chris, and the, uh, Chris Parker, the drummer and the bass player, who was initially a guy named Kenny Aronson, and then Tony Garnier got on, who's still there. Tony is still there. They'd go off, and Bob and I would come out with acoustic guitars. And there was a spot, right, on Bob. The rest of the stage is black, right? Just one spot, circle around him, from about three quarters front. So it's hitting him in the forehead, you know, so he's got those deep shadows, beautiful lighting. Huh? Casts a nice shadow behind him. I'm just on the edge of that circle of light to his right so I can watch his hands to see where he's going because Bob didn't really tell you what he was going to do, you know. And I'm out of the light. My face is out of the light, but my guitar is in the light. 
so they can wash my hands if they want to. But it's not about me. It's about Bob Dylan. That's, you know, the way it should be. And we would just do anything. Whatever he wanted, he would just play any song. And I love that seat of the pants thing for myself, following people and just going. So uh, we went to, um, we were playing in London, England. And there were a lot of big time rock and roll people were there, you know. Um, everybody, pretty much. Because anywhere we'd go, anybody from the music business would come to see Bob, you know, because that's Bob Dylan. Mm -hmm. His impact, as much as it's been on the culture, what he did for musicians is everybody was totally influenced by him. Somebody said there's like more than one Beatle standing in the wings, you know, stuff like that at this show. So we get to that little acoustic section in the middle, and I'm over on the side, and Bob's playing, and we're doing his song, Mr. Tambourine Man. And there's a, there's a line in there where he says, just to dance beneath the diamond sky with one hand waving free. I started crying. I'm making sure my face is out of the light, but there's like tears running down. I'm playing like, I'm here with Bob Dylan. And he's singing Mr. Tambourine Man, and I'm playing along. Couldn't believe it. You know? Yeah, I had a good time with Bob. Eventually, um, I quit because it got to be too much, the running back and forth. Um, the show, Lauren, I, I tried, that was another time when I had tried to quit Saturday Night Live because Bob made me a very good financial offer to really join the band and, and stay and be around. A very good offer. And I talked to Lauren about it. And he said, oh, no, no, you stay here. It's going to be better. You'll make more money here, and you'll get well-known because of the television when many more people see you, you know. They don't like that. And I probably wound up making almost as much money as I would have made with Bob, almost. Uh, and certainly did get more well-known from staying and doing the, the television stuff. Mm -hmm. But that was great. To get to play with Bob was a dream. Mm -hmm. whole thing's a dream.